This is Free to Exchange, the show where free markets and free thinking scholars meet. I'm your host, Ben Powell. There are two themes to today's show. One is UCLA. Both of my guests earned their PhDs at UCLA back when the school was a leading producer of great free market thinkers. The second theme is the legacy of involuntary servitude. On the first half of the show, we will explore how important discrimination is compared to government regulation and the economic difficulties that some black Americans experience today. Then, on the second half of the show, we're gonna discuss the economics of military conscription and the role economists played in ending it in the United States and what that means for selective service, the last remaining remnant of conscription that we still have with us today. My first guest is Dr. Walter E. Williams. Dr. Walter Williams is the John M. Olin Distinguished Professor of Economics at George Mason University. He's the author of 10 books, including The State Against the Blacks, which was later met, made into this PBS documentary, Good Intentions. And more recently, Race and Economics, How Much Can Be Blamed on Discrimination, which is our topic for discussion today. Dr. Williams, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. So let's start with kind of our situation in contemporary America today. If we turn on the news, it's not at all odd to see race problems highlighted, whether it's NFL uh, football players kneeling in protest to something, mm -hmm. or just the economic hardships that many black Americans are facing today. What's the labor market like, labor market participation like, for black people today? Well, today, uh, the labor market participation rate among black Americans is perhaps the lowest that it's ever been. And uh, to put it in perspective, in 1948, uh, if you just look at teenagers, the labor force participation rate of black teenagers was slightly higher than uh, white teenagers. Matter of fact, it was 108%. And the unemployment rate in 1948 of black teenagers was less than that of white teenagers. Today, you're talking about um, a black teenage unemployment being double, perhaps triple, in some cases, in some cities, of uh, that of white teenagers. So, and you can't explain that by discrimination. That is, you can't say, oh, well, gee, uh, black teenage unemployment was lower in the 1940s because there was less discrimination. Well, this is what I see when I turn on the news. They say that this is just discrimination. That's why black participation's lower. Why don't you think so? Well, I, 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 well there, there are many reasons. Uh, that is, the labor force participation rate uh, is affected by various handout programs. That is, many Americans will say, and, and includes whites as well, uh, many Americans say, well, look, I'm not going to take a $7.25 uh, uh, cents a, uh, an hour job at McDonald's when I can get just as much from unemployment compensation or from welfare. And so I think that uh, welfare and unemployment compensation uh, has an impact on labor force participation rate of everybody, but I think it has a disproportionate effect on black Americans. All right, let's dial this back in history a little bit to kind of take us through the evolution of this, not just to 1948, but back to turn of the century even, and not just youths, but general black participation rates in yeah. the economy were much greater, but we started to see economic regulations starting to change. Maybe the first part of this is unionization. What effect did that have on, on blacks in the labor force? Well, I think unions have supported various laws to protect their members at the expense of, uh, of blacks. Uh, perhaps no, most notably was the Davis-Bacon Act that was written, our first national minimum wage law that was written in 1931. And if you go to page 6513 of the congressional record on March 31st, 1931, you'll see many of the arguments that were made in Congress. One congressman said, see that contract over there? He brings cheap color labor up from the South, puts them in cabins, and it's labor of that sort that's competing with white Americans. Therefore, we need the Davis-Bacon Act. Now, what the Davis-Bacon Act does, it creates a minimum wage law that is uh, on all federally financed and, uh, and or assisted construction projects, you must pay the prevailing wage. And the prevailing wage is, is pretty high. And so, uh, so it, it gives employers the incentive to discriminate against blacks and also discriminate against non-union labor. And this Davis Bacon, this is what we hear about today when we hear about prevailing wage being debated in various states. And prevailing really doesn't mean market prevailing, does it? No, it doesn't. Normally, the Labor Department illegally interprets the prevailing wage as a union wage or higher. And, and just one example of it, uh, some years ago I was reading an article in the newspaper where 
uh, in, a, in a housing project. They were rebuilding, refurbishing a housing project, and they hired some of the residents in the project to nail uh, plywood uh, to, to, to make floors. And the you know, officer from the uh, Labor Department came around and said, look, you're not paying those guys the prevailing wage. They were being paid $12 an hour, but the, for a carpenter, it had to be $25 an hour, and these guys just did not have the skills to be paid $25, uh, $25 an hour. And this is why you think it disproportionately discriminates against minorities. Yes, yes. Matter of fact, the, the, any wage regulation discriminates against people who are deemed as less preferred. And that can, can, that can include low-skilled workers, and it can include uh, minority workers. Because their productivity differences are different? Yeah, because, because their productivity are different. That is the lower skill. That is, just ask anybody, any, any of our viewers, and just ask them the question, if they had to pay $10 an hour to no matter whom they hire, would they hire a high-skilled person at $10 an hour or a low-skilled person at $10 an hour? I'm betting they're going to say a high-skilled person. I bet you're right. So let me just defend the kernel of truth, maybe, in the, in the discrimination argument here. Isn't it also the case, if I have to pay everybody $10 an hour and I have racist preferences, it just got cheaper for me to indulge them? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, one of my books was uh, South Africa's War Against Capitalism that I wrote in 1989. And I spent three months in South Africa studying labor markets in South Africa. And I discovered that labor unions, white labor unions that would never have a black as a member, were major supporters of the minimum wage law for blacks. And their stated reason was to protect white workers from having to compete with low wage black workers. And matter of fact, what the minimum wage, what the, what, without the uh, uh, minimum wage law that came under the, the Job Reservation Act, uh, many contractors were cheating on the Job Reservation Act and hiring blacks. But white, what, but white workers said, well, we can stop that just by having a minimum wage law. So the market was undercutting the racism because it was in the interest of the capitalists. Oh, yes. That is, um, uh, free markets are pro the less preferred people. They're pro uh, people who have low skills. They're pro people who are deemed as outsiders or people don't, who don't have much political clout. So as we go through history, then we start with the Davis-Bacon and then we get uh, maybe what we in West Texas might call the less popular NRA, uh, the National Recovery Act. Yeah. Uh, how did that change things? Well, it just gave more power to labor unions and, and, and more power to labor unions meant uh, uh, fewer opportunities for minorities. And matter of fact, in the 1800s and early 1900s, uh, black uh, leaders such as W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, they wrote articles saying that labor unions are the black man's worst enemy. But unfortunately today, that black politicians, they do the bidding of labor unions. They, they're not like their uh, predecessors back in the late 1800s or early 1900s. And then, of course, we go on with the Fair State Labor Standards Act and we get our first minimum wage in the United States. And uh, that's had a similar effect here as to what you're describing in South Africa, probably. Oh, yes. But however, the, the state intentions behind our support, the American support for the minimum wage law, uh, the, the state intentions are very, very good. They want to help low-skilled people. That's a state intention. But when you look at public policy, you can't look at intentions. You have to ask, what is the effect? Mm -hmm. And so you have in South Africa, they have one set of intentions. In the United States, they have another set of intentions, but the effect is the same in both places. As we go beyond that, the thing that's expanded the most in the United States now maybe might be occupational licensure, uh, where you have to get the government permission in order to practice an occupation. How has this, or has this, disproportionately affected minorities? Well, <clears throat> one, one area that I've written a lot about has been the taxi cab industry. And so what does it take to be able to own and operate a taxi? Well, you need a car, you need a driver's license, and, and a few other things. But however, in cities like New York at one time, you had to buy a taxi cab medallion, a license to own and operate one taxi. And at one time, that medallion came to $1 million. Now, you take a poor, illiterate Italian back 
back in the 1920s, if he had industry and ambition, he goes out and buys a car, he writes the word taxi on it. He was in business because there was free market. But today, and uh, in, in, uh, in more recent times, it's not a free market. But the happy thing for me is the evolution of Lyft and Uber. And right now, as a result of Lyft and Uber, uh, taxi cab medallions in New York that approach a million dollars, they now sell for about $150,000. It's wonderful how uh, technology is eroding that monopoly. That's right. So let me ask you a question here. You have this in your book from a, a state licensing exam. And this one's from as recently as 1968 for plumbers and tradesmen. And this is their written test to be a practitioner. It says, blank is to composer as Longfellow is to blank. And we have Van Gogh, Riley, Hayden here as choices, poet, entertainer, president. What does this have to do with plumbing? Well, it, it has a lot to do with plumbing. That is, it's one way to keep people out of plumbing. And, and plumbers love to give exams. Electricians uh, have exa they had exams just like that to restrict entry. If it doesn't really affect plumbing, but it restricts entry, why does that particular type of written exam harm minorities more than white people? Well, I, I, well, I, I, I think many white people would not be able to answer that question. So. <laughs> you could try for yourselves. <laughs> So, so it, it, I think it injures everybody, but people with less education would be more affected, would be more, in, a lower quality education, they'd be more impacted by uh, such questions. Which unfortunately right now in the United States is where many black people are stuck in their local school district monopolies. Oh, uh, that's right. That matter of fact, uh, I've often said that if I were the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and I wanted to sabotage black academic excellence, I could not find a better way for doing so than the public school system in most cities. Well, this points to the, the last question for you here as we're, we're winding down then. Uh, in the opposite direction, what would you do to improve the situation for minorities in the United States today? Well, I, I would just declare uh, that, that people had the right to get into business without licenses. I would abolish many of the minimum, the, the minimum wage law. I would abolish many licensing laws that yeah, I, I believe that I believe that licensing laws prevent people from entering an activity, but certification laws gives out information. And I believe that people do need in, information about the quality of the services, but that can be provided through uh, uh, activities like certification, which are not uh, re, uh, restrictive on entry. All right. Well, thank you very much for for joining us here today. Up next. Did you know that economists played a crucial role in ending the military draft in the United States? Stick around to find out why. Free to Exchange is a joint project of Texas Tech's Free Market Institute and Texas Tech Public Media. More information is available at fmi.ttu.edu. Welcome back. Joining me now is Dr. David Henderson. Dr. Henderson is a professor emeritus at the Naval Postgraduate School and a research fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's the author or editor of three books and also a regular commentator in the popular press. David, welcome to Texas Tech and to the show. Thank you, Ben. So let's begin, before we get into the economics of this, is just kind of broad brush strokes. What's the history of conscription or the draft in the United States? I'm going to start with the 20th century rather than going way back. It was introduced in 1917 by Woodrow Wilson to fight the First World War. It ended after the First World War came back in 1940 before America got in World War II, right. ended in 47 for a year, came back in 48, and we had it until 1973. And since then we've been draft free, but we still all register for selective service. Uh, tell me a little bit about this, the latest time that we, we got in run of it. People who usually defend the draft would say that the, the good thing about it, or a good thing about it, is that it lowers the cost of having a military. Right, and what they're pointing to is the obvious fact that if you can conscript people, you don't have to pay them a market wage. And every draft bill I looked at when people were trying to reintroduce it in 1979 had a substantial cut in first term pay. So they're pointing to the budget cost. But the economist's big input, the economist's big contribution in the 1960s was to say no, the real cost is the cost of society, and society includes those conscripts. They're giving up something valuable. So if you're paying them 10,000 a year, but they could make 20,000 a year, the cost to them is 10,000. Right, so the taxpayers don't bear the full cost. Instead, it's a particularly 
burdensome task, yes. tax that falls very narrowly. Yes, William Meckling, who was later who was earlier head of the Gates Commission, wrote a piece in Fortune calling it a very high tax on unlucky young men. And people with the Gates Commission, and we'll talk about that in a minute, hopefully, who did who estimated the cost, found that the tax rate was between 40 and 80 percent for the typical person. And that's not just a marginal rate on those last few dollars. That's like you giving up 80 percent of your whole income. This seems actually just kind of bizarre in the broader public finance theory then of like, who would design an optimal tax that says, you're going to pay this 80% margin rate just in your 20s for a little while, and then never again later on? This, this, do you know of anything anywhere like this? Um, you know, I've never thought of it that way. Well, slavery. <laughs> but that wasn't just for a few years. That was for life for, for American slaves. So no, it really is hard to think of something other than that. So in terms of the economic costs, it's obvious that they're bearing the cost. But say a little bit more about how society bears this cost or what's lost when you conscript people. Okay, well, they are part of society. So when I said society's bearing the cost, the real cost is on those people and they're part of society. And so when I've argued with people, they say, well, this isn't a social cost. I say, if you include the draftees, it is. And so it's, uh, you know, so take one case, 1958, Elvis Presley is drafted. He was making a million dollars a year. He gets paid like $3,000 a year. Right. So his tax rate, I think, is 99.7%. And he's part of society. Now, it is true. A lot of people in society are doing without those Elvis Presley records he would have made. Right. This is, I think this is an important point. And some people might pass off the Elvis Presley and say, that's an entertainer. Yeah. We're economists. So all value counts equally. But what if it were Bill Gates? Yes. Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard after two years. If he had dropped out of Harvard and we'd had a draft, he might have been government grade 1A in the selective service system and might have gone off to the military somewhere. He probably, with his father's wealth, would have got out of, got out of being in Vietnam, but he wouldn't have been working on Microsoft. And so that's a huge cost. So often, that, then people kind of seem to miss this point of the, the huge cost. That society loses out on all those innovations and wealth that he could have created. If we're looking at this just from the standpoint of Let's take someone who says, I want to have the strongest military possible. Using this logic, can you make the case to them that not having a draft makes the military stronger? Yes. And let me do it this way. I, I taught for half of my life at the Naval Postgraduate School. I taught military officers. When I started there in 1984, some of them had some experience with the draft. I'd ask them, do you want a draft back? And it's usually 80-20 against. Over time, within five years, it was 100 to 0 against. And I quit asking because it wasn't interesting. But the reason was always the same. It wasn't mainly about freedom, which is my reason. It was, why would I want to be in charge of people who don't want to be there? How is that going to work well? And when you consider an increasingly technological military to draft people for two years so they just finally get to where they know something and then they're out is mm -hmm. kind of absurd. It not to mention Bill Gates, if he's creating all this wealth in the private sector, he's paying a tax rate on that that they could use to entice more of the people to volunteer who want to be there, right? Absolutely. And then think Elvis Presley. When he was doing his records, the top marginal tax rate was 91%. So, yeah, they could have got a lot out of him. They could have got a lot more privates by letting him not be one. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, so tell me a little bit about then the story behind how we got run of the draft last time and the role economists having these type of conversations played in it. Right. I think the most important economist in this was a young man named Martin Anderson who never had kids. And he was actually in the Ayn Rand circle to some extent, the novelist of Atlas Shrugged. And he was very against the draft philosophically and understood the economic argument. And he went to Richard Nixon when Richard Nixon was running for the, pre for the nomination in 1967 and persuaded Nixon to come out against the draft. Nixon gets elected, Marty's on his staff, and Marty gets the Gates Commission formed to look at the draft, and they get Milton Friedman as one of the members. The Gates Commission's an inter interesting commission. It didn't start off unanimous. It was five in favor, five against, five on the fence. They came out 14 to zero in favor of getting rid of the draft with one abstention, not based on disagreement, but based on the fact that he hadn't been there for the meetings, he'd been sick. So Milton Friedman, who was on this commission, he's known as a, a master economic communicator. He's certainly done that on his, his show on PBS. He goes in and he's making arguments similar to the ones that you've been making here on the show today with these people. 
But there's one particular exchange that stands out when General Westmoreland, who had been the commander of U.S. forces in Vietnam, and now is chief of staff at the Pentagon, I believe. Of the Army, right. Chief of staff of the Army. And he's a defender of the draft and comes in to testify to the commission, right? Right. What happened? Okay, I've got it in my book, The Joy of Freedom. It's just worth hey, getting. He, he doesn't miss the plug for the book there. <laughs> uh, Westmoreland stated that he didn't want to command an army of mercenaries. Freeman asked, General, would you rather command an army of slaves? Westmoreland replied, I don't like to hear our patriotic draftees referred to as slaves. Freeman said, I don't like to hear our patriotic volunteers referred to as mercenaries. If they are mercenaries, then I, sir, am a mercenary professor, and you, sir, are a mercenary general, and we are served by mercenary physicians, we use a mercenary lawyer, and we get our meat from a mercenary butcher. Wow. <laughs> uh, I think that really does put it into perspective, though, of all of these other services, we get people to voluntarily provide for us by offering them an incentive. Yes. When we take something as important as defense of the country, why would that be an exception from the way that we organize economic activity? Yeah, that's really, it, there's not a good answer to that. That's a good yes. rhetorical question. <laughs> so, probably not a great one to ask a guest sometimes. <laughs> so what we have left of after this, so they tried to reinstate it in 1979, 78, right. 79. 79. And economists, again, kind of shoot it down. But selective service still exists. Right. So part of, the, part of the compromise when they got rid of the draft was to say, OK, well, we'll have a draft if we get in a really big war, so we need a selective service machinery. So they did have people registering. But in 1975, the Ford administration hit this huge deficit with the recession. They're looking around for little budget cuts and big budget cuts. They said, hey, let's cut that agency. So they ended selective service registration in 1975. It wasn't reintroduced again until 1980 by President Carter. Mm -hmm. And we still have it with us today. And every now and then, people in Congress will sponsor bills that say that you know there's 100 people who work there. It costs a few million bucks. We should get rid of it. And by the way, that's not the main cost. The main cost is a whole bunch of 18-year-old boys having to go and fill out that form. There's a psychic cost. There's a time cost that swamps the budgetary cost. And of course, as you pointed out when you gave the brief history of this, this has come and gone before. Yes. How important do you think it is to get rid of selective service? I think it's important as a statement. I actually am fairly confident we aren't going to have a draft for the reason I mentioned earlier. It's very hard to fit draftees into our highly technological military, but it'd be a very important statement about this country's commitment to freedom. It is just really awful to have 18-year-olds, they turn 18, and what's their birthday present? You sign up at the post office. Yeah, I'm with you, David. <laughs> and thank you for being a mercenary professor and flying out here to visit us at Texas Tech today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. The good news is that the worst forms of involuntary servitude have been largely stamped out in the United States. In the middle of the 19th century, we ended chattel slavery, and then in the 1970s, with input from economists, we ended the military draft. Unfortunately, as discussions with both of my guests today reveal, there's still much to be done. Coercive government regulations that limit competition often end up disproportionately hurting minorities who are descendants of people who were slaves. They could be better off economically if they were more free. At the same time, while we got run of the draft, we still have selective service, which could be used to re-implement the draft. I think we could be freer and safer if we got run of that as well. In both cases, I think the answer is more freedom and less government regulation. Tune in next week. <laughs>